Okay, so I think uh, we can start. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for coming for our um, penultimate lecture on this topic. And uh, today I will discuss how uh, struck, uh, briefly, it will be a, a, sh a short part in the presentation, how structuring neuronal responses uh, in such a way that to allow for lossless transformation, which is what we discussed last time, how it leads to hyperbolic geometry. Then the second part is um, how to quantify information conveyed by large neural population. And the third part is comparison with retinal arrays. And the last lecture, which we will um, merge with um, this one, depending on how many questions are there, will be uh, evidence for hyperbolic geometry at different uh, stages within biological circuits, in the stimuli, in perception, and um, by implication within the neural circuits itself. So last time, uh, we discussed that, um, well, technically I said that if it is a logistic function of the stimulus, but Matteo pointed out that actually it's for all binary responses, um, the expression will be more complicated, but will also work, but we, we can construct um, an information preserving population vector of this kind where uh, in order to read out neural responses without loss, we can take this construction, which is linear in neural responses. It's not linear in terms of the stimuli, but linear in terms of neural responses, you add these uh, binary responses times um, uh, the argument of the uh, what, what goes on in the logistic function. So if this is not a pure logistic function, then um, this will be this function will be an approximation to that argument. So taking one over this, subtracting minus one, and taking a logarithm to get to the equivalent of this function, and that leads to um, a vector, and uh, it has the same dimensionality as the stimulus, so it doesn't grow um, with the number of neurons. But uh, the number of values it takes grows exponentially with the number of uh, with the number of neurons. And now monitoring this vector t allows us to capture <coughs> what um, what is a, uh, whatever information is contained in neural responses. So it's not that there is no loss during the encoding from stimuli to neural responses but there is no loss for the readout. There is a compression from stimuli to neural responses, but whatever the neural responses contain, you can read out using this um, vector t. So, and this is for a specific <coughs> illustration uh, that this vector t will take many, many values um, if our neural population is large, but you can coarse grain them into a smaller number of bins, and uh, we will see that that leads to an efficient way of capturing information with a smaller number of bins. So in this case, it will be seen nine bins, three along x-axis and three along y-axis. So now I would like to discuss the connection between this population preserving vector and hyperbolic geometry. So we, um, we, we discussed that you, um, we have stimuli that go between minus infinity and plus infinity, but because we put things through a logistic nonlinearity, which is true for most um, neurons, then um, the, this population vector in general is limited in its magnitude. So what's shown in this panel A, you have a stimulus that technically goes between minus infinity and plus infinity. But if you have a finite number of neurons, so I think in this case it's 16 neurons, then 
the well and they are all aligned. In this case, the stimulus is one dimensional. So instead of population vector, we are talking about population count. And how does the population count changes as we vary the stimulus along this axis? Because of the nonlinearities in neural responses, the population count is a nonlinear function of the stimulus. And it is compressed because the infinite range for stimuli is uh, transferred to a, a finite um, range in terms of the neural responses. So the, the larger the number of neurons, the, the bigger is this range. And um, another view, if we now have multidimensional stimuli, so then we, we, uh, what is showing on the right is um, the compression that occurs when we are showing stimuli at different directions. So if, uh, in this case, this is uh, an example input distribution, a Gaussian input distribution, and if you show the um, uh, stimuli along one axis that um, has larger variance, then the, com the component of... Um, the population vector um, will has a larger amplitude than if you are um, doing it along the shorter minor axis of the input distribution. But in both cases, you are compressing what is an infinite plane into a finite radius. So uh, on now some background about hyperbolic geometry and why this compression resembles what, um, what we get there. So <laughs> the hyperbolic geometry has, uh, is, um, is a nonlinear geometry, and uh, there, are, there is no perfect model of vi visualization model for how to visualize it in, uh, in kind of ord ordinary plane. However, there are two representations that are um, used most common, and they both bear Poincaré names. So the one on the left is called Poincaré half plane, and the one on the right is a Poincaré um, circle. So the um, we can start with either one of those, but if we talk about uh, panel A, then um, this uh, illustrates that, so in, in technically you see the, uh, this um, grid, and the grid is getting smaller as we are approaching smaller values in Y. And the reason, um, and technically the metric, the continuous metric, um, is given by dx plus dy divided by the y squared. As a result, if I want to take uh, go between two points A and B, the shortest way in terms of minimizing this distance is um, going inside uh, the plane towards larger Y values. So why is this uh, popular metric? Um, one reason is that, as you can see, I'm trying to um, make a connection with hierarchical networks meaning that if we place, um, if we discretize um, the space in these squares and place units um, in the center of each square, then to find the geodesic that goes between two points A and B approximates the distance that we would use if we want to compute along the network that is formed by the centers of the squares. So it doesn't, uh, in this si simulation, doesn't exactly match. But if, uh, for example, you, if you talk, um, take this point here, A, and um, um, between Okay, so between between two points on the the cursor, if, if it is a laser pointer, somehow moves slower. Mm 
Does anybody know how to undo the pointer option? Mm. <laughs> now, now yeah. okay, you're stuck with this, but it's just slow. And um, so between, um, between two points A and B, in order to go, um, in order to compute the distance along the network, you have to go up a tree and then go back down. So, and technically it will be the number of steps. And it is approximated by this uh, trajectory. And the solution in, for the Poincaré half plane for this trajectory is a circle that um, approaches the line y equals 0 at 90 degrees. So that's one representation of the of Poincaré space, uh, hyperbolic space. So it emphasizes the link with the hierarchical network. The one that um, I think is closer to our neuronal case is this Poincaré um, circle. In this case, it's a spherically symmetric model. And we take infinite plane and we apply this transformation that you take the radius on the plane and you apply tangent transformation to get points within a radius of one. So infinity shown here as a uh, dashed circle is uh, unattainable. So that, that's, the, that's the perfection. But um, that's infinity, is a dash, becomes a, a circle of radius one corresponding to radius um, equal to one. And um, the, uh, the geodesics here, some sample geodesics are shown in the red. And in this case, unlike going straight between points, the line of shortest distance is attracted to the center of the space. And for uh, points that are further separated by the, some angle, then it's faster to go towards the center of the network and then back out. So the distance between points, uh, for, for most points, will be uh, twice the radius. And you can also see that um, the points are sampled uniformly. And um, in, uh, say, Euclidean space, but because of the compression, the density of points increases exponentially. With, um, uh, with the radius. So now it is similar to our, our population vector transformation uh, because um, here, for example, in the, on the y-axis, we take the, um, there is a compression that is limited by the number of neurons. And the number of different states uh, for this vector will increase exponentially as we approach the boundaries um, of the space. So one can see that if you have a binary neuron, and because of this, the probability of spiking is limited between 0 and 1. So in general, there will be uh, some kind of a nonlinearity like this. And uh, then the transformation between uh, uh, similar to this information preserving population vector T will have a compression that is similar to a Poincaré representation. So now um, I'll stop and I will ask for questions. Are there questions? Can you maybe repeat this last part of the link between uh, the hyperbolic geometry and the compression of, into the into the population vector? Um, so, <clears throat> um, what is shown here on the left is an example. Um, you know, maybe to reward it in different ways. 
uh, in this particular case, all neurons have zero threshold, so they are all aligned, and they all have this tension nonlinearity. So, in this case, the, what is shown on the uh, panel A is, um, and imagine they all have. So, in this kind of um, simplified case, we said that the neurons are sensitive to the same direction, so they're all receptive fields are aligned, and the stimulus is also along that line. So it's kind of a one-dimensional stimulus and one-dimensional uh, population vector, which becomes population count. So now, um, uh, because the neuro, you know, because of this tension on linearity, the for individual neurons. There is, a, and they're being added in effect. The population count also inherits this uh, tension on linearity. And so the, then there is a compression between the stimulus that goes between technically minus infinity and plus infinity to a finite range. And the range depends on the number of neurons that you have, because the maximum value of the population count is when all neurons are on. So in this case, there are 16 neurons, so the maximum value will be 16. If neural responses, if we work in the case where neural responses are take values minus 1 and 1, then the smallest value that the population count can have is minus 16. Now, if you think about what are the possible values of um, that the population count can take. They're not distributed uniformly along, um, along this axis. So if, if, we, if we say, um, if we project the density of states um, along the y-axis, you will see that there is a peak at minus 16 and plus 16. So if you recall, um, in a few lectures back, Matteo made um, kind of a histogram. And for a binary neuron, um, it, um, you know, the density of states is just two states, minus 1 and plus 1. If you have more neurons, this uh, spreads out, but still most of, um, most of the states is um, uh, in this region. And you can show that it's Expon so the number of states increases exponentially from zero. Um, and the transformation that we have, this tench transformation, <laughs> is the same transformation as uh, in the Poincaré um, construction on this panel B. In other words, what um, we are showing here with neural responses for one-dimensional stimuli is a cross-section of this Poincaré plane along a, a one particularly chosen diameter. That, um, let, let's, let, let's have more questions. So I try to represent on the, uh, on the blackboard what you just said, that essentially this non-linearity transforms uh, PDF uh, on the on the real axis into a PDF uh, on the um, on the on the response axis, on the vertical axis, and mm -hmm. uh, and it has more concentration towards uh, the uh, endpoints. Right? This is what you wanted to. Yes, that's right. So this, yeah. Thank you. Yes, it looks good. Yeah, so this is for one-dimensional stimuli. And yes. now imagine that you have um, isotropic uh, distribution um, in, say, two dimensions. And, uh, um, and then we apply this uh, tench transformation because imagine that now the um, receptive fields are uniformly distributed along the um, angular direction. Response. 
then uh, there would be a maximum. Uh, so here you go through this uh, nonlinearity. Okay. And then your points will be closer to the border. Right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so that that's the uh, that's the connection. That basically the binary nature of neurons. And if you have more neurons, then leads to this um, exponential um, concentration of states. And uh, so, and we need this in order to achieve um, kind of readout. So the the readout will be uh, that is information preserving from the neural population takes us to this um, uh, hyperbolic space. So um, the summary of this uh, first part um, is that if we want to structure work with variables that allow for lossless information transmission within the neural circuits, then we have to uh, transform from stimuli to a hyperbolic representation of these stimuli. And um, I, it also, I think, overlaps with the previous results that um, not exactly talked about um, information theory, but it was uh, a practical observation that if you structure the connections within network according to this hidden hyperbolic structure, um, as an in internet, for example, then this allows for efficient routing of information. So there are these uh, a series of papers by Klukov and, and others about um, hyperbolic geometry of the internet or hyperbolic geometry of complex networks. And uh, the third reason is that the hyperbolic geometry, as we discussed, uh, describes um, hierarchical uh, tree-like networks. It's an approximation. So if you think about a tree here, and what we have um, in our senses is the sensory periphery. We receive derivative information of, we do not have access to the uh, underlying tree, but we have a derivative um, information either in terms of pixels or in terms of molecules in the case of smell and then you would like to compute the distance between them so a correct measure of uh, distance between them will um, you, you can choose one of the measures that you can choose is the one that reflects this underlying tree so the two molecules will be more similar if um, uh, according to how deep into the tree one has to go to find their co-modulator or kind of root cause. Um, so that's um, uh, one of the connections between hyperbolic geometry and lossless information transmission. Okay. Any questions on this part? Anything that should be um, expanded upon? You would like to know more? So this is a um, picture of uh, hyperboloid and uh, it, it, a surface of constant curvature. So what? Um, anything else we should um, expand upon? Okay. I can't quite see the audience, but... Um, um, yes, no, uh, there seem okay. to be... Everything is clear. Okay. Not completely. All right. 
So now another point is what if you would like to ask what is the kind of optimal neural code? So one could make statements. Um, you know, imagine that you have um, a given number of neurons and a given radius of the hyperbolic space. So it turns out, so we know that the, num the radius, um, th the number of states goes um, exponentially with the radius. So one can turn this around and say that the optimal radius of the hyperbolic space should be the logarithm of the number of neurons you have, approximately. And, um, um, and the reason for this is that if you have small number of neurons and large hyperbolic space, then you won't be able to sample it uh, fully. So in order to achieve a kind of reasonable uniform coverage of the space, it's um, um, the number of neurons has to be related um, to the size of the space. And incidentally, this is also the, the amount of information that you get by observing discrete responses. So there is an uh, expression, um, you can look it up in the Bialik's textbook, on uh, the maximum uh, information that one can obtain from uh, um, by observing n binary re responses, and it grows technically as n times log n plus corrections, but in the limit of large n, it grows exponentially with the, the number of observations. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now um, I would like to discuss uh, practical strategies for quantifying information um, conveyed by large neuronal populations. So even though we have this nonlinear transformation, the, um, the information it still can be computed kind of in a way that some in a way that disregards it just two vectors, but we will need to be careful in terms of um, discretizing appropriately the number of states. But other than that, it's information between um, just two vectors. So as we discussed last time, information preserving population vector has the same dimensionality as the stimulus, assuming technically as the set of receptive fields, but we are only probing receptive fields with stimuli, so they cannot have larger dimensionality. And what is interesting is that dimensionality for this vector does not increase with the number of neurons, only the number of values that this vector takes. So now, uh, how to compute this in practice? So we will be computing it for 1,000 or more neurons. And um, so the approximation is um, as follows. So one, um, the full information that we are interested in is um, this information between two vectors. So they have many components. And therefore, we will leave aside um, the vector t for now and think about decomposing the vector s. And you can write this as a sum of various conditional information um, values here. So it's in the sum uh, information between one component and the components of vector t. And when we are talking about the first component, then um, we don't condition on anything else. So when b is equal to 1, there is no condition. But then it's information between the second component and the uh, components of the vector t, now conditional on s1, and so on. So you add gradually other terms, each time conditioning upon the previous um, uh, components of the input. Any questions about this expression? So 
So everybody is familiar with the chain rule for information or it, would it be helpful to write it down on the board? Uh, so 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 maybe I, I write it uh, just uh, explicitly. So this is uh, the mutual information between S1 and T plus the mutual information between uh, S2 and uh, T2 T3, Td conditional on S1 plus the mutual information, and you go on like this, by components, right? Yes. Last one is the mutual information between SD and TD condition S1, SD minus 1. And this relation is exact, as you can check yeah. uh, by the chain rule of probability. Okay, so. This thing is just the expected value of the log of the probability of the stimulus and S by the probability of T and probability of S. Okay, and as an exercise you can show that you can decompose this into all these parts, okay? So, yes, yeah, so, so for example, the, you can write this expected value of log P of S given T divided by P of S, right? And then, uh, and then use the chain rule on this. Okay, so the fact that uh, 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 yeah, I'll say is the fact that uh, you have T and S can be written as P of S1 and T1 times P of um, S2, T2 given S1, T1, etc., etc. Okay? Right, Tanya? Yes, thank you. Okay, so now um, these uh, numbers of um, um, uh, the number of terms. So each of the terms um, uh, one can compute, but their difficulty increases. So the the first term that is not conditional on anything is uh, is relatively easy to compute. But then these pro progressive terms that have conditional information, they are more difficult because they, they're based on this conditional probability distribution where you have to sample uh, together many different components of stimuli. So therefore, um, we will be doing approximations. So the first approximation 
uh, is actually exact if uh, inputs are isotropic. So if we think about our Poincaré circle, if the similar are uniformly distributed in terms of angles and um, you know, neuronal receptive fields are also uniformly distributed in terms of angles, then um, one can show that all of this, uh, one can make one simplification, meaning that instead of the vector uh, components of vector t, what we need are two scalar values. One is the component of t along the stimulus component s that is currently being considered, plus the magnitude uh, of all components larger than v um, times uh, square root. So this uh, simplifies the calculation in terms of the number of components in, uh, in terms of t. So we call it the isotropic approximation. Then the next um, approximation is uh, to drop this uh, square root. Um, there is no, we couldn't justify it, but we just um, just tried it and, uh, and see how that performs. And then the third approximation is when you drop the, uh, all the conditional uh, independent, uh, all, the, all the conditions. So in this case, it is exact if uh, input distribution factorizes. So maybe an exponential distribution in x and um, exponential distribution in y. So these are the three approximations. And what, um, what we will see is that they are progressively easier to compute and they are progressively less accurate. But, um, um, you know, how accurate, let's, we can examine. So I will skip maybe some slides here. Um, so we have a question. Sorry. Yes. But are they approximation or exact when, when for example, we have an isotropic uh, distribution? So it should be exact under certain cases. So um, for the isotropic, they are uh, exact. But if the stimulus distribution is not isotropic, then it will be an approximation. Okay, okay so we use them also in other cases as approximations. Yeah, so, yeah, right. So in other cases, you, you can use it as an approximation, but you know it should work well for stimuli that approximately are isotropic or the third approximation if the inputs are independent. So okay, the other thanks. question, yeah, please. No. I think the other question uh, you can ask is when they are uh, uh, not exact, do they provide an upper bound or a lower bound? Can one show whether uh, this provides uh, an upper bound or a lower bound. So what do you think? I think in most cases it's a lower bound. But uh, one has to, we, we will see the simulations, so it uh, then depends um, on, on the basis. Uh, for example, with natural scenes, if for natural stimuli, you can have a basis where it is in the Fourier components or, or a principal components of natural stimuli. And um, the case where they're more closely to be independent as in independent components of natural scenes. And we will see that uh, it's a lower bound when we use the kind of independent component approximation but it can be larger than the information if the basis is not, not independent. Okay. okay. And also, uh, in <coughs> parallel, we also tried um, another method that is not based on this approximation and is based on uh, um, full sampling. 
kind of a direct computation. And um, um, maybe I will just go over this calculation. So we call it a Monte Carlo estimator of mutual information. And it only works in the case where the stimuli are conditionally independent. So as we discussed in, um, um, in previous lectures, the information is a difference between two terms. One is uh, entropy of responses, H of R, and entropy of responses, H of R given S. So let's see, maybe I have an expression here. Um, no, but maybe, Matteo, would you mind writing it down? So we need information between R and S is equal to H of R minus H of R given S. So, um, in principle, um, so the advantage, so there are these two terms. If we assume that neurons are conditionally independent, which is, um, um, you know, which can be, you know, this is one of the assumptions that we have been making, although sometimes um, removing it. So meaning that the neural response depends on the stimulus, but does not depend on responses of other neurons conditional on the stimulus. In this case, uh, this H of R given S is a sum across neurons. So in other words, we are saying that the noise is independent across neurons, and this is, uh, then becomes a sum across all neurons. So then it's a little bit easier. So this is um, this slide here. So when j is equal to 0, meaning when neurons are conditionally independent, then um, this entropy, there is an exact expression. It's a sum over neurons. And here one can uh, write just the their average firing rate for a given stimulus times the argument of the logistic function minus a constant function of the stimulus. So that is not um, um, kind of a reasonable computation. So I should um, pause here and um, clarify two things. So one, um, in this approximation, so advantages of this formula is that technically it is um, valid for neurons that are not conditionally independent. So between S and T, they do not have to be conditionally independent. We can have correlation between neurons, a correlated variability, even when the stimulus is um, fixed. But we are trying to compare this expression to the ground truth expression from um, many neurons. And that expression we can only evaluate when neurons are conditionally independent. So that's um, why in parallel with this approximation I'm discussing this Monte Carlo est um, estimator that only works for conditionally independent neurons. I, I'm hoping that um, there will be questions that I can clarify about the logic. So this equation is valid when neurons are not conditionally independent because um, it, this, this is just a derivation between S and T. As we said, it's information preserving population vector, and some noise correlations are allowed. And to augment this, we will discuss in a Monte Carlo approximation that only works when j is equal to 0. Okay? But in this case, we can say that h of uh, this conditional entropy, there is a relatively easy expression that is not exponential 
in the number of neurons. And with H of R, well, this one, one has to work um, um, and approximate the, uh, this function can be approximated without bias and uh, um, with an empirical average. And we can check that this, um, let's see, I will just show you the sampling that uh, of, of the Mont Monte Carlo estimate estimator. Let's see, where is it called? Here. So it is unbiased as shown here. So of you know for mm, the estimated bias between our estimator and the true information, and they are um, centered at zero, meaning that the bias is not there for the um, this Monte Carlo estimator. But the disadvantage of this Monte Carlo estimator is that it is unbiased, it's valid for general nonlinearities, but it requires um, that the neurons be conditionally independent. It also requires precise knowledge of neuronal nonlinearities. So that's why we talk about approximations. I'll skip this slide for now. And these are our um, approximations that we talked about. So now um, I will show you the the results let's see um, of simulation so in this case um, this is the number of neurons can go between say 100 and 1000 and this is for an This is for um, stimuli that are three-dimensional, and the stimuli are uncorrelated, and they are also isotropically distributed on a sphere. So you can have the Poincaré ball not only in two dimensions, but generalization in higher dimensions. So in this case, so the axis for the information is on the y-axis, and the black line is um, because is this Monte Carlo estimator that technically should be unbiased as long as the noise correlations are zero. And then we are trying to approximate, check this with uh, our three approximation. The isotropic approximation that should be exact in this case because the stimuli are um, isotropic. And then uh, approximations to this, which is component conditional and component independent. So one can see uh, in practice that these are less accurate, but uh, still preserve about 80% of the information for a large number of neurons. And once again, the advantage of these um, approximations is that they now work they will they should work in the case of real neurons that have some noise correlation versus this full information will be affected by the presence of noise correlations any questions about this simulation uh yeah if if i remember correctly you say that uh in order to have um information preserving population vector we need to assume that the uh, the distribution of the responses conditional to the to the stimuli are uncorrelated right because we say that ma there must be uh, some logistic functions and then we consider the full distribution as the product of them so <clears throat> that was the derivation but actually, 
you can have some correlations. Let's um, go over um, the, uh, this slide from uh, I'm not sure I have this slide from previous. I'm using somewhat different computer, but um, so remember, I will. Um, I think I will ask Matteo maybe to write on the board. Then um, let's see. So what we have is. Um, there my computer is slow. So. If anybody maybe can pull it up on Slack, I'm not sure um, the slides from the previous um, lectures. So we are discussing this, right? And we were saying uh, yeah. this is the product over all the neurons of uh, a probability of Ri given s, right? Yes. And now you're saying, uh, what if these are uh, not independent, right? Yeah, no, what I mean <laughs> is that they, I mean, based on what you wrote, they are independent because we, we wrote the full probability as the product of the single probability of each neuron, right? Yes, yes. So we are assuming that they are conditionally independent? Yes, here we are assuming that they are conditionally independent. Okay. However, however, imagine so if, if because they are in this conditional independent, we can write this as a function a of s times a function um, f of r times e to the um, this uh, vector t times vector r. Uh, something like this. So. Something like this, uh, Tanya? Just a second. So, um, So that's right, ri fi of s, right, minus ai of s. Yes, yeah. something like that. So then uh, imagine, and then our the sum of um, ri fi of s is our kind of information preserving population vector. This, this, yeah, this part. Yeah, uh, because this is it's the, the product. TI. Yeah, this is um, ti. I think Ri is within uh, um, uh, Ri is within the T, and then uh, we have. Ah, an, yes. Uh, okay. Yes, I think so S multiplying. T. I'll leave it as an Fi. Okay. Yes, and then some S. So because uh, I would. Yeah. Okay. So this Ri times Fi of S is a product, or can be written as T dot S vector. Yeah. Okay. So this whole sum, um, sum over R i f i of s, is the vector t, scalar product vector s. Times uh, s. Okay. And then uh, yes, you can. Yeah. So so far, these are conditionally independent neurons. Now imagine that. Um, to our final probability distribution times uh, uh, s. I think now what you are saying is that here you can introduce a correlation, an interaction between right. uh, the, the different r. As yeah. long as it does not depend on the stimulus, uh, then this is still uh, uh, sufficient statistics. Yes. 
Okay, so, so the, the only requirement is that the joint, the joint condition probability can be written as in the exponential form as written on the, on the board, right? Yes. Minus but then, then t can take a different form. Uh, so C I J R I R J minus A of S. So as long as uh, this uh, C I J does not uh, depend on S, then this is still a sufficient statistics. And so you can also have the responses that are correlated. Right, Tanya? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. So, um, therefore, um, right. So, therefore, we can use these um, approximations even in re, um, kind of in the case. Where, and um, also, as um, you can go back to the slides of the previous lecture, once you have these correlations, this GIJ and this form, if I plot the firing rate of one neuron, because of correlations with other neurons that have different preferred stimuli, your tuning curve will have very, can have a very strange shape. So if a neuron is correlated with another neuron that is tuned to a different stimulus, then it will be a very multi-peak tuning curve. But one, you know, if, you, if we write that in this exponential form, then one doesn't need to be confused by the complicated shape of a single neuron tuning function. Okay, so that, thank you for this question. So then we had a question in the chat, um, also an interesting uh, question, an observation that if you look here, um, on, on this slide, the information doesn't uh, quite um, increase with um, um, the number of neurons, right? I think that that's... Uh, so first of all, you can... Uh, uh, there are two comments I can make. Maybe, um, maybe there are more <laughs> that... Uh, uh, you know, one can think of, but this is what two comments that I have. So first, information is roughly logarithmic in the number of neurons. That's first statement. Second, in this um, simulation, we um, took the probability distribution of stimuli, as shown here, so it was uniformly distributed on a sphere. And we took some distribution of neural thresholds. Um, I think they were all set to the same value. So this, um, this, while we can read out what these neurons, what this neural population has, the thresholds have not been optimized to convey maximal information possible. So. This uh, this just this simulation checks the accuracy of how well we can read out whatever information content there is in the neural population, but this does not represent the maximum that these neurons can convey because the position of the thresholds was not optimized for the stimulus distribution. Any other questions? Okay. So um, that's um, um, another point. And then we can check um, other approximations. And this is uh, another, I would say, potentially interesting um, 
uh, comment is um, in this case we have two-dimensional stimuli here and there are only nine neurons but they are distributions of um, um, receptive field is asymmetric so as we discussed for example in natural scenes the uh, the optimal distribution of uh, receptive field is not uniform. So our isotropic approximation, it doesn't, um, doesn't have to work well, although in this case um, it continues to work well. So in this case we have this Monte Carlo estimator in black, and this is a full vector sufficient statistics S and T. And here the two um, components, um, there is no isotropic approximation, but component conditional and component independent. And it also raises an interesting question of how I should order these components. Um, because in the equation that you see on the board for the um, information um, uh, kind of decomposition, we haven't talked about the, the ordering, whether there is any preference for the ordering. And uh, intuitively, I think one could maybe guess that you should start if, with evaluating components that have the largest variance. So I don't have analytical results to that um, support in this, but we have uh, empirical simulations showing that it is better to start in this graph um, the computation with the component of the largest variance. So this is shown here in the red, um, two red lines. So the blue line is the component independent um, calculation. So in this case it doesn't matter in what order you're evaluating uh, information between S1 and T1, information between S2 and T2, you can order them in any way. But with the component conditional, it does matter. So what is shown here is, oops. So we can look at um, the x-axis, which is the ratio of the standard deviation um, in component 1 over component 2. So, um, in the case where the first uh, stimulus component has smaller variance than the second one, then it's better to first, uh, the dashed line is better, and it corresponds to um, I guess we start with component S, um, S2 and then S1. So we first evaluate the information with respect to component of largest variance and then add the component of the smallest variance conditional on the larger variance. So I think there are some themes that are similar to renormalization group approach for those of you who are familiar with this, such that we first evaluate information about the smoothly varying components in the stimulus and then transition to evaluating information in more, about more fine-grained details conditional upon the value of the smoothly varying component. And then it switches, so when um, across this line um, then the standard deviation of component S1 is larger than the standard deviation of S2, and then it's better to start the computation with S1 continued by S2. Any questions about this? No, it looks like uh, there are no questions. Yeah, so for example, I often think about these components as Fourier components. If, um, you know, then S1 will be the 
lowest frequency and S2 will be the next frequency and so on. So when we think about evaluating information between a natural scene and neural response, we will first say, well, let's take information about the mean luminance and then add information about um, T, which is the average um, population count across the array. And then we talk about information between higher frequency and because we um, add the, well, I will, I will show you this slide. It's like taking a Fourier mode of the population array. Um, and then this, is, this slide was now higher dimensional stimuli, so natural stimuli, 100 dimensions. So without any approximations, we, um, actually we can't do any, anything except for the independent component approximation because of this high dimensionality. And this is information about real neural responses. We fit the um, bare receptive fields, fit the nonlinearity, and uh, even though they are not conditionally independent, we, we try to do this Monte Carlo approximation, assuming they are. And then you can see uh, this question about lower bound and the upper bound. So if the components uh, along which we are evaluating are independent, in this case, they were ICA components, then this is a lower bound. But um, if I say that I evaluate in the basis where they're not independent, as in PCA components with natural scenes, then you can have more um, overestimation of information. Okay, any questions about this graph? So this is the summary so far, and now um, a practical calculation for retinal arrays where we talk about these components, they will be actually the free components of the stimulus. And the goal of this computation is to show to you that our results that we obtained with two neurons and cell type specialization actually holds in the case with um, um, multiple populations of, you know, large neural populations, each of which represents a single cell type. So if you like, we can have a, a short break, and that's up to the group. Um, but if there is a need for a break, then that would be a good place to so I leave it the decision to the to the you know like to the situation on the ground. The situation on the ground. Uh, so do we want to take a break? Uh, uh, yes, I think uh, there is. Uh, we take a break of uh, five minutes or so. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. Thank you. Thanks. Recording in progress. Should we start again? What do you think? Tanya, are you Yes, online? I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. So the students are getting ready. OK, very good. OK. So we are back in the retina, and we will be applying this formula that we derived, and now optimize uh, parameters of neuronal threshold, but using um, like many arrays. So the question is that, as we discussed in the retina, there are 
um, a stimulus comes in and it separates it into the channel on channel for encoding increments of light intensity and the off channel for decoding decrements. And then the experimental observation is that the off neurons split into subtypes. Uh, they're called adapting and sensitizing, but for the purposes of our analysis, it's a, uh, adapting is a high threshold, sensitizing is a low threshold cell, and they form overlapping mosaics. And the question is, why is the on channel doesn't split and the other one splits? So previously, we only talked about encoding of, say, two neurons have the same threshold and um, versus um, two neurons different threshold. But now the computation is more complicated because I, I, don't, I can have the same number of neurons, but in the case of the green mosaic that encodes on neurons, they have slightly different uh, response regions, so they provide higher spatial resolution, but they will not provide, but the advantage of the overlapping mosaic is that although they have lower spatial resolution, they have higher um, intensity resolution. So we can tell better uh, differences in uh, the light, um, uh, the values of light intensity. So now, which of them is better? And that's the computation that depends on the structure of the stimuli and uh, parameters of the um, nonlinearities. So to foreshadow some results um, that we will come uh, obtain, suppose the stimulus is white noise, means completely like a TV flicker, completely uncorrelated in space. In that case, you might be able to guess that this solution um, with the single higher density array is better because I'm getting independent information and different uh, pixels. But in the case of natural scenes that are more smooth and more correlated, it's possible that I will have higher in overall information with overlapping arrays because the stimulus is correlated and the, um, there is not much variance in the spatial domain. And instead, I can use um, the two neurons allocated to the same location to better report the actual value of light intensity. So th you can think of this calculation as asking uh, the question of the trade-off between intensity coding versus uh, spatial resolution coding. And now we will be applying our um, prescription. So in our case, the stimuli are translation invariant, and therefore the stimulus distribution factorizes in, um, in the basis, in the Fourier basis. And uh, uh, also natural stimuli have the sparse spectrum of 1 over k squared, so we have uh, a separation of scales, so we know that um, we should start based on the previous calculation with computing uh, information with respect to the zeroth component and then going to um, higher frequencies. And here is, we will, because it's a large computation, we, um, so the stimulus is very high dimensional and the only approximation that we can reason, uh, that we can do is independent um, information approximation. So instead of talking about information between S and R, we talk information about um, stimuli S and this information preserving vector T. But in addition, we say this is just a sum over Fourier components between the corresponding Fourier components of the stimulus and um, the population vector. So the TK is um, a sum of uh, what is TK. So I, I, the claim is that this is a Fourier a transform of uh, the activity of the neuronal array. But here is the derivation. So it's a sum over neurons, the response of the JACE neuron, times, as we know, the receptive field of that JACE neuron. 
But what is it? It's um, a Fourier transform of a standard um, receptive field for each neuron, which is maybe a Gaussian, which is known, times, because their position in the, um, kind of each uh, neuron um, is centered at different position, there will be a Fourier factor, IK times the center of um, that receptive field. So the, the case component of the information-preserving population vector is, a, um, as you can see from this expression, it's a Fourier component of uh, weighted activity in the neuronal array. Any questions about this statement? So then we, we talked about that, and now some results. So what we are um, asking is, uh, as a function of the noise level of uh, individual neurons and their average uh, firing rate or average spiking threshold. So now what is shown in color scale is the difference in information conveyed between overlapping arrays and uh, a single higher density array. And there is a curve um, denoted by white line that separates positive values where this information is better compared to the negative values where the information in the high density array is um, better. So you can see that the same result, the echo of the same result that we had with two neurons, that when noise level, sorry, when noise level is large, the um, one neuron per location wins compared to when um, noise level is small. So that's. Um, and the next step compared to the calculation with um, two neurons. And uh, now one can um, take different cell types with um, uh, different species. So these are in the salamander, these are in uh, primates, and um, these are in uh, guinea pigs. And uh, um, they have uh, a slightly different uh, filtering kind of incoming noise levels. So the shape of the separation curve is uh, different depending on uh, different um, uh, species. But um, um, here are some data um, for various cell types. So this is the correct prediction of, uh, uh, this is the off cell type is here, and the on cell type is here. And uh, so we would you know, one could make separate predictions that these um, uh, cell types should split into two. So, for example, in the primate, the parvacellar off neurons, we think, should uh, split further into the subtypes. And uh, uh, same thing here and uh, um, uh, in the case of the salamander. There are actually two um, different uh, cell types. Um, uh, yes. So the vertical axis uh, uh, means that uh, high means spike in threshold means uh, uh, sparse coding in the sense that the uh, yes. rate of spikes is, is, is lower, right? Yes. So as, you, as, um, as we discussed a few lectures back, we had this picture of... Um, information surface as a function of noise and it was given for a, um, it was plotted for a given uh, mean uh, spike in threshold for the two neurons but as you vary that threshold the position of the critical point which in this case our white line will move around so when we compare it with data um, that's why it's plotted in this way, as a function of the average threshold and as a function of the noise level. 
Okay. All right, so this might be um, a good place to stop. So um, what I showed in these simulations that the general conclusions that were obtained with two neurons generalize to population of neurons as in retinal arrays. And you can predict new subtypes that, um, as we know, there is always a debate how many different cell types are there in the retina or in the brain. And one can uh, make suggestions that to look for additional subtypes within the off types based on uh, information theory. So, and the overall summary for this lecture today is that, um, for, I guess for the past two uh, lectures, is um, that there is a prescription for reading out neuronal information without loss. You can approximate it in three. Maybe you can come up with additional approximations. This is just the starting point. Um, and these approximations are different in terms of computing resources that they take or equivalently number of stimuli that you can have because it's not just the computing but also the statistical sampling of the underlying probability distributions. And then the last part from today was uh, specialization between uh, cell types where we take into account um, the structure of the stimulus and the fact that the trade-off is uh, also between spatial resolution and intensity coding. Okay. So uh, well, just to understand, so uh, from the data from the salamander, uh, the guinea pig, and, and the other, uh, uh, from the experiment, what you get are the receptive fields, right? So the WI. And then uh, uh, this plot that you show are uh, essentially a result of uh, numerical cal calculation that, that, that you do on, say, computing the information, the mutual information. So the, the whole plot is pure, um, pure simulation. Uh, pure analysis of information transmission, no data. The data comes in is when we plot uh, observe average noise level and mean spike in thresholds for um, various uh, neuronal types. Okay. So, okay, so in this case, it says, you know, these are the two circles and there are the two different types of off neurons. But then, um, for example, the white circle, white triangle, it represents the slow on neurons. So according to this description, we think this will be a, a rare case where the on channel has to split into two. And there should be another uh, partner uh, cell type because it is optimal for it to um, kind of coordinate its coding. So in this case, mm -hmm. this is the on neuron. So the notation is that if it is a white, it means it's an on neuronal type, and if it is black, it's in the off neuronal type. So um, some of these cell types are known, and some of them are not known. Okay, so... And, so for uh, example, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah, so for example, here, um, you know, so far analysis from Steve Bacchus' lab was either in the salamander or in the uh, mouse. And this uh, nearby uh, middle panel is for a primate. So we see that indeed the off neuron is in this range where they split, and the on neuron is in the range where they're not supposed to split. So, but given that they are in this region where they are supposed to split, we think that, you know, actually there will be multiple cell types corresponding to that pixel. Okay, so, and what is the, the sigma n? Uh, sigma n was 
the noise oh, sorry uh, sigma n was uh, the effective noise after filtering so these neurons they have um, different temporal filters and so we thought that because they have different temporal filters the effective noise is um, uh, different so in prior mm -hmm. to um, neuronal nonlinearity okay so essentially what changes between these three plots uh, is not only this value of sigma n right it's it's also uh, something which has to do yes. with the, the arrangement uh, of neurons or uh, uh, the, the temporal filter the, ah, the, the temporal kind filters. Of, okay yes so if there is a photoreceptor and it has some noise in it but the temporal filter is different and so the the effective kind of additional noise that comes from the input can be less or more depending on uh, the um, the filtering and also um, the salamander and primate and guinea pig they operate at different temperature so salamander is a cold-blooded um, creature so everything is slower and has larger noise um, but it compensates for it with the filtering. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the, the, the noise is uh, uh, complicated. Yeah. So um, slower, but then on the other hand, when you have a uh, um, higher temperature, um, there's a higher well, photon isomerization kind of spontaneous uh, conversion events. So the, the primate has to pay for larger um, rates of um, kind of photon short noise. Yeah. Okay, questions? Okay. Well, so the next lecture will be the last lecture, and uh, I will be showing you, uh, hopefully, it will be. Uh, maybe less mass, but more pictures of hyperbolic space and evidence for hyperbolic geometry um, in the natural world and in uh, human perception and also in um, other parts of um, like gene expression, other parts of biology. So that's the plan for the last lecture. Okay. So then thank you very much. Thank you. If there are no more questions, then uh, we meet again on Friday. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.